Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our weekly Community Conversations, a series uh, offered by the School of Education at the University at Albany. Uh, my name is uh, Jason Lane, and I have the privilege of being the Dean of the School of Education. And we're delighted to be able to welcome you to uh, what I think is going to be a, a terrific conversation uh, with Caitlin and Mark uh, Geronda, uh, who we'll introduce uh, here in a moment. Uh, this is uh, part of our teleteaching series, uh, trying to provide in partnership with the New York State Master uh, Teacher Program. Before we get to that, let me just offer a few other uh, comments. Uh, this is uh, a conversation that was initiated uh, when uh, COVID-19 hit and we all had to move rapidly to the remote educational environment. Uh, as part of that, uh, our faculty students worked together to create uh, remoteed.org, which is a resource uh, freely available to parents and teachers and students and that provides uh, tips and tricks on how to effectively engage in remote uh, instruction uh, and learning, as well as provides a, a curated list of over a thousand uh, online resources that is organized by both subject matter and grade level. If you haven't checked it out already, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, our sister site, Essential Ed, uh, is offered by the Capital Region BOCES and offers a range of uh, 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 curricula that is standards based and aligned with New York State standards and is available there for teachers to be able to think about ways to uh, advance their particular work with uh, with uh, with students. So uh, check out those two sites. Uh, as part of the community conversation series, uh, we have uh, previously launched our leading in times of change uh, series, which is a partnership with the Capital Region BOCES, where we're talking about leadership issues related to education. Uh, from the K to college levels, thinking about the challenges associated with uh, managing uh, education and learning in COVID-19. We also have our uh, stress and collective trauma series uh, with two of the faculty members here at the University uh, at Albany, Alana Gordas uh, and Alex Peters, really digging into issues around mental health uh, and providing uh, resources and tools to help uh, each of us better grapple with the mental health uh, issues uh, that are uh, associated with the pandemic and certainly being exasperated in many ways by the pandemic. We're also offering a series of summer camps uh, in partnership with the New York State Master Teacher Program. These summer camps uh, have been going all summer. Uh, they, we, have, uh, some, we have one coming up uh, this coming week, which is on coding boot camp for grades four through seven. I uh, encourage you to check that out and you can go to the website there uh, to find out more. So uh, those are all great opportunities. In addition, tomorrow morning we are launching our second annual Safe, Prepared, and Effective Learning Environment Summit, or the School Safety Summit, as uh, we call it shorthand. Uh, last year we did this. We had a great turnout for our in-person event of over 150 people. It's free and open to the public. Uh, this year, because of the environment we're in, it's going to be virtual. And so tomorrow we'll kick off with a conversation around how to safely reopen your school buildings, campuses, and classrooms. On August 6th, uh, we'll be looking at the Phantom Menace, keeping students in school safe in cyberspace. I think particularly relevant right now is so many more of our uh, children and students are moving into the virtual environment. And on August 13th, uh, the conversation will be on psychological first aid and recovery uh, for students and uh, staff. And so we hope that you'll be able to join us. Uh, registration is required. And you can go to www.albany.edu slash education and scroll down and you'll see a link to the School Safety uh, Summit site. So please uh, join us. I know we have more than 100 already signed up for tomorrow morning, but it's going to be a great conversation about uh, how do we think about these issues of safety and learning. Uh, today, uh, we have a great uh, session lined up for us uh, looking at Desmos in the uh, STEM classroom. And we have uh, two experts uh, who are also New York State master teachers. Uh, they are teachers in Saratoga Springs. Uh, they are graduates of Binghamton University, uh, and we are simply delighted uh, to have them with us today. And so, Caitlin and Mark Geronda, I am going to turn it over to you to get to the real heart of the matter. So, thank you for being with us, and it's all yours. All right. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're just going to share our screen. I'm Caitlin Geronda. I teach math at Saratoga Springs. I'm Mark Geronda. I teach science, mainly just chemistry and AP chemistry at Saratoga Springs. And we are going to get started. So before we start, if everybody could just type in the chat really quick what your role is. Are you a teacher in the classroom? What are you teaching? Are you in some other role? Um, but just so we could get an idea of that. 
All right, so um, we just grabbed this image straight from NSTA, and I think a lot of the time people might think of math and science and, and ELA even kind of existing in their own silos with their own sort of standards, and these are the math standards, and these are the science standards, and that's that. But uh, what you find when you kind of start to unpack them a little bit is they all kind of have their own overlapping ranges. All three of them will overlap with each other. Obviously math and science will have a lot of overlapping, but same with ELA and science. There's a lot of writing in science, a lot of critiquing, a lot of analyzing, et cetera. And we think uh, Desmos is a really good way to kind of, especially in the math and science world, marry those two subject matters together. Yeah, and it's typically a math tool, but I think often we get stuck in this silo of, oh, that's a tool for math. I'm not going to look at that. And what we're hoping to show you guys today is that this activity builder is this really um, intensely like creative and problem solving based program that you can really engage in all sorts of different learning with your students. So this video is, is under a minute. It's really quick, but it's just going to give you a basic look at what the Desmos Activity Builder looks like. And then we're gonna spend a lot of time today playing. So hopefully that will be something fun. At Desmos, we want students to experience creativity and connection in math. We want teachers to experience teaching the same way. So we built our free creative activity builder. Visit the Activity Builder website and click Create New Activity. There you can title your activity, add screens, and then add components to those screens to help students develop their ideas. Ask students what they notice and wonder with an image and a text input. Ask them to sketch a line with a positive y-intercept using a sketch. Ask them to rank the days of the week from best to worst using an ordered list. Create activity experiences for your students and then share your activities with other teachers. It all starts at teacher.desmos.com. So very, very general overview of some of the features that we're going to play with today. But we're going to get started. So in one minute, we're going to have you guys open up a screen in your browser and do this. I just want to walk through the directions before then. So we're going to go to student.desmos.com. And it's going to bring up this screen over here on the right where it says, welcome, enter your class. You will enter this code and then you'll hit join. And when you do this with your students, you can do this this way or you can post a direct link that will fill in the code automatically for them, which is often an advantage with younger students. Once we get in there, you're going to have a couple options, which will be to sign in with Google. This is great if you work at a Google school because you are going to see that it automatically links with your Google Classroom. And if not, you can do continue without signing in. Our school is a Microsoft school, so we do not have accounts automatically generated. But you can also have students put in different identifiers. So we'll put in, you know, ex example, every student would have a number and that, you know, keeps their privacy by them not having to enter their names. So um, the website again, student.desmos.com, you're going to enter that code. And when you start to hit join, you'll have some activities already pre-generated for you to just walk through and just kind of play around and get used to all the features from the student side of things um, that Desmos has to offer. And we figured we would take about 10, maybe 15 minutes to let you guys all just experience what it's like to be a Desmos student. And then on our end, as we share our screen, we'll give you some perspective of what it looks like from a teacher's end. So we'll call you guys back in about 10 minutes if you just leave your computer unmuted. But again, go to student.desmos.com enter that code and hit join. And if you have any questions, we've got the chat open so we can um, be watching the chat. So see you guys in about 10 minutes.
just one note as you're working, and again, keep working, you don't need to pause, but um, remember that it's okay to get stuff wrong here. That's gonna be a great example for us to be able to look at on the teacher end. So don't feel self-conscious if there's things you're getting stuck on. And secondly, if you're not a science teacher or even a math teacher, there, there are still a lot of applications for other content areas. So you're going to, going to see as you go through further. So again, feel free to drop questions in the chat and we'll talk to you soon. Again, uh, keep working. Just just listen as, as you're going through these uh, Desmos activities. What we're doing as your quote teachers is, and we'll we'll show you this in a minute. Um, looking at all your responses, tracking how fast you're working, seeing the trends and what you're getting incorrect and what you're getting correct, and stuff like that. And um, we'll we'll give you a firsthand look in a few minutes. But that's what we're doing from the teacher perspective right now. And we've got about five-ish minutes left of our playtime, which is perfect. Again, just remember if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll talk to you guys in a couple more minutes.
All right, that was our very annoying timer noise. Um, we, I don't think they heard it because we were muted. Hopefully not. Yeah. Um, hopefully uh, you did not hear that, but we can see on our end that there's a couple people who have a few more slides. So we're gonna give you about two more minutes. So let's say at 423, we can come back to the Zoom and we'll start talking about some of these features and how we might use it in our classroom. Yeah. So about two more minutes. Okay, um, if we want to return back to the Zoom, we're just sharing our screen again, and we are at the teacher side of things. So this is what you would see as your dashboard when you first log into the activity as a teacher. Um, if you have, as we're talking, any ideas you want to share, questions, comments, etc., you can type them in the chat, or I, I, there's a, is there a raise your hand feature with Zoom? I always get all the virtual meeting features mixed up. If you <laughs> I, want would, to I would say just, yeah, feel free to unmute yourself and chime in. This is a small yeah. enough group that as much as, as you all want to contribute, go for it. <laughs> so the first thing we're actually going to go to is summary. And right here, um, if you would unclick anonymous, anonymous. Yeah, so we could see everyone's name. But if you wanted to share class data, you can hit anonymize. And then it'll automatically generate either a mathematician or a scientist. And then it not only makes everyone comfortable if they didn't progress or they didn't do such a good job, but it gets the kids kind of Googling like, who is this guy or gal? The other fun thing is they have very diverse groups of uh, mathematicians and scientists. They really focus on integrating females and integrating people of all different cultures in. And so I've learned a lot about mathematicians and scientists I didn't know about from other cultures that way too which is fun. <laughs> um, next to anonymize is pacing. So what that allows you to do is if you have uh, something you want to make sure you announce after slide five, you can restrict how far they can get so that you watch Johnny in the back of the room just clicking his way through it and finish it in five seconds. Or you know that a lot of kids, there's like a misconception occurring before they move on to slide six or anything that you would want to pace the kids for. And that's really great for synchronous learning too, because we're doing this activity from our basement in Clifton Park with you. But if you're doing this with your students synchronously, you can pace them and no one will be able to go past that slide. And then when you press stop, they'll be able to move on. So you guys will notice if you were at the end, if you looked back at your screen now, you would actually have been jumped to that slide. And let's see, Lorinda said that her students love the anonymized feature. I could not agree more. And next to pacing button is pause. So if you get to a point maybe where the kids are just struggling, like you look at this data here and they got to number six and it was just all X's, like number eight right now has one check mark. Maybe we need to pause, have some teacher led instruction or just some quick intervention to be like, okay, what's going on with number eight? Maybe they're misunderstanding something. Maybe we made something wrong with the key. It happens. And that, that enables you to just kind of take a little more control over the activity. It's my favorite way to point out like my favorite mistake. If I see somebody made a mistake, I can pull up their slide and I can say, look what Pythagoras did here. And somebody inevitably might yell out that they are Pythagoras, but the kids don't have to be embarrassed otherwise. Okay, so 
if we um let's look at maybe number three okay if we just click on yeah three. so what we're going to do is go through a couple features that you guys can see so here you can see i made this video and i embedded it so you can embed your own videos which is nice and you can do more than just math and science analysis here we were seeing how familiar with you and i can overlay your responses or i can see them individually so i see here that five of my participants had no experience it's really good information for me as a pre-assessment. Yeah, or you can even put it at the end right. as a post-assessment. Like a lot of people do fist to five. If you want to kind of have mm -hmm. another layer of anonymity, you can throw that in as a little wrap up. Right. These <laughs> um, scientific notation tasks are really fun because they're a great way to play with scientific notation, but you know, still be seeing the payoff of it in a sort of scientific way. Yeah, and if you look on the on the left side there, sorry. On the solution. Yeah, system. you can see any student who completed the correct answer, you can see the orbit around the sun. So it's a really quick way to go, oh, Sophie got it right, Caroline did not. Right, and same with the speakers that you all filled, I can see who got it right instantly. And the other thing is, as I'm looking at this summary, if I see on a particular slide, like on this one, one student had this error symbol, I know that they had an error with their scientific notation, and I know to message that student privately or go over to them if I'm in person and talk through it. Um, but then we wanted to get into some more content specific examples, and so that's when we got into these. So this one in particular, which looked like this to you guys, the putting the phases of mitosis in order, was one where we clicked and dragged to order them. That's another capability we have. And from a teacher pers perspective, I can see individual responses but I can also overlay your responses and see what the most common place for it was. So here I can see the majority of people put prophase first and anaphase one, two, or three, we were confused <laughs> on where that went, yeah. right? So you have a lot of really good feedback right away, which is nice. Same thing with this one, which was choosing all that apply for which are common to plants and animals. And again, from the summary page, anyone with an X, I can see got at least part of it wrong anyone with a check, I can see quickly that they got it right. So it's very quick formative assessment for me and for kids, they can do this synchronously or asynchronously. I did a lot of my lessons asynchronously for this and that went pretty well. Yeah. Do you wanna talk about the card sorts? Uh, so for the card sorts, which from your perspective looked like this, you were just sorting things into element compounds and mixtures and each um, heading had two correct answers. So you had to drag two to mixture, two to compound, and two to element, like that. And then when you go to the teacher's perspective, Oops. what you can see is like Kathleen crushed it. <laughs> Alfred got one of the sorts correct, but forgot a card, and then mix mismatched the other remaining cards. Uh, Xing Tung knew one of them, got one of them half right, and then added too many to the last one. And I see this as being really important, even if we are back in school at some point, because I can't give out card sorts every period like I used to be able to. And so if students are one to one, you can do this with any subject area. I do it with graphing a lot in math, but I've seen people do this with Spanish, you know, verbs doing regular versus irregular or with vocabulary and doing, you know, la ropa versus and la escuela. That's the extent of my Spanish, but uh, <laughs> This next one is one of my favorites and uh, we're not gonna spend a ton of time on it, but this physics one is, is really cool because we've just uploaded this video. I've asked you a question and if you noticed, you could see others' responses, but then you have the ability to sketch and notice here we can see these different ideas of what people thought would happen. This is a great way to have conversations in your class to say, okay, Sophie thinks this happens. Do you agree or disagree? And I can also overlay them to sort of see the trends, which is really nice. Yeah, so if you have a lot of kids in your class and you first go to the responses tab, it might be a little overwhelming. It's hard for you to see like, what's the trend here? So you just click that overlay and it's like, I think a lot of students seem to think it would go up and then down. And, you know, we got a lot of conversations you can start about, well, didn't the person stop walking at some points? There were moments in time where he was at rest and you notice the x-axis is time we have to somehow include that in the graph because time doesn't stop because he stopped. And this last version, which to you guys looked like this, where it actually played out a solution for us, allows students to get that instant self-checking feedback to compare. 
And I just think this feature for a physics class that's starting to study kinematics, a calculus class, any of those sort of groups would be a really powerful um, critical thinking tool that you could do with kids remotely, yeah. which I think is pretty and big. And you can even have the students explain, like now they can see it and maybe they had some visual confirmation. Oh, this was it. But how do you know that they actually understand why that's the right answer? Right. You can have them explain it and contrast it with their own graph. Yep. Yeah. And so then the last thing we want to show you guys was it's Desmos started as a graphing calculator, so it's clearly able to graph. So what I asked you guys to do, let's go to teacher, is to pick three points. And I'm glad to see people picked some different points. But what I did is carry that over to the graph. And what you can see is everybody picks some different points. So when I overlay these, we actually get a set of class data. And so if you're ever graphing in a science classroom, this is a great way to get a class graph, look at class data, and really see what your class um, is doing as a whole, as well as being able to respond to individual students. Or if you're doing, you know, I know obviously labs are kind of up in the air, yeah. but once things return to some sense of normalcy, I know a lot of times in my chemistry classroom, I split uh, each lab table does a different variable or a different length of time or something that allows me to save materials, but also generate really good class data. And if we can put it straight into Desmos, I don't have to worry about like, having all the tables on the board, the kids copy it down on their pieces of paper, then they graph it. They can just generate this graph And it takes And it takes out the walking around in a classroom that would need to happen too, which yeah. is nice. So then the last sort of feature on here was having you guys do uh, just a multiple choice question. And notice I can see that these people said yes, who said no. You're able to mark them correct or incorrect. I didn't because this was not a correct or incorrect question. But then you were able to explain. And so these are things that we can use again with students. So from a teacher perspective, it's a really rich environment to teach in. And um, hopefully for a student, you guys saw that there were some tools in here that you could use. So I wanted to take a second and pause before we went anywhere else and say, are there any questions we can answer? Does anybody want to unmute themselves and share an experience they've had using this? and? Then we have one more activity we want to do today. Give everybody a minute and feel free to unmute yourself. Or type questions in the chat too. I already feel like if we're going to be remote in any capacity in the fall, I'm going to be taking some lab data from the past and throwing it up here. Well, and that's the great thing with this too, is that you can save data from class to class. So I can bring my first block data up and have my fourth oh, block added We have competitions. It. Yep. We have competitions. I just <laughs> wanted to ask a quick question. Yeah, I of had course. a little bit of difficulty in ordering the phases of mitosis yeah. on my touch screen Chromebook. I was able to do it with a touchpad, but on my touch screen, I couldn't get it in the right order. It kept flipping it. So when you clicked it, would it not drag? Was that the issue? Um, it wouldn't drag to the right location and stay there. I couldn't lock it in place. It kept moving around if I use the touch screen. Interesting. I always find a lot of touch screen laptops and tablets end up being kind of a pain and discourage my students, if they can, to just try to use the trackpad because it just inevitably has some error going on. So our rooms both of our classrooms are equipped with some touchscreen tablets. And every time they flip it around into just full on touchscreen mode, there's always some mistake that occurs, whether that's immediately or not. So I, I don't know how to troubleshoot around that, but I would encourage the trackpad. Yeah, I also have, I've had kids do this on mobile and I've not seen that issue. Um, so I don't know if anybody in the chat had that frustration and they could share a fix they had, but that might be one of those kinks that you might need to unfortunately figure out with students. I, I almost wonder if it's one of those things where there's a clear mobile version of the, of the Desmos activities and a desktop version. And if those touchscreen tablets that are like hybrid, almost like there's some software glitch where it doesn't know, are you mobile or are you on the desktop? That's just me throwing out a guess, but. Um, let's see, we've got some other questions. So I see how you could use this for science and math. How could you use it for English other than vocabulary? So I've seen a lot of the justification um, sort of argumentation. I've seen this used in 
English classes, especially because students can answer a question and then have to justify. And on top of that, students may need to, or they can look at other students' answers, which is um, a tool I've seen a lot of English teachers use. You can embed video clips. So if you were doing a you know, journalism class and you were looking at some sort of a video clip of a news story, you can embed that. But I agree, for an English classroom, you're not doing as much of the data analysis piece, but you could still do ordering of, you know, the phases of a, um, you know, a storyline and a story or different things like that. But you also can just use it as a question answer sort of interactive PowerPoint sort of thing. I wonder if you can even snip sh very short articles or from a book and just see like, what do you think the tone is here? What do you think the, yeah. so I, I'm not an English teacher, but that's just me throwing it out. An idea just literally popped into my head. <laughs> um, we do have one more activity that I actually think could be useful for English and especially history if you're a non-STEM on this meeting. So I'll give everybody like another 30 seconds with questions or things they want to chime in on. And then um, we'll do our last activity for the day. All right, Frank had a question there. Oh, yep. When we did the graphing slide, is it possible to overlay a teacher data set? Yes, absolutely. So you as a teacher could go through before your class and participate as a participant and then just bring up your data and do it that way. Or you can actually in the activity go through on that screen and put your data points into the graph. It's pretty easy to enter a table on the graph. So yep. I think that's a great idea, Frank. Okay, let's talk one last activity. And if you have questions, keep sharing them. Um, so some of us, hopefully, as children or with our own children, played the game Guess Who? It was uh, definitely one of my favorites. And I think that Guess Who is a really fun game because you're learning how to distinguish between characteristics, ask good questions, and all these sort of different things that are really critical thinking at a young age. And so this video, our volume may not get loud enough to play this, but you can at least see the idea of it. And we'll only play about 30 seconds of it. And then we're gonna do an activity like this that again could be applied to any classroom area. No, yeah. Oh, you can't hear it at all. Okay, so this is Desmos Polygraph. I will just narrate it as we go here. <laughs> and so we're talking about this idea of guess who. So we're going to start by like choosing a person that's important to us. So I'm choosing this girl with brown hair. And my partner is going to need to ask me yes or no questions to try to figure out who I've picked. So they asked, does she have long hair? I'm saying yes. So then that partner can eliminate any of the people who don't have long hair. Now we can continue asking yes or no questions. Do they have a solid colored shirt? And so we're narrowing down key characteristics of this person. You can start to think about in a you know, science classroom, key characteristics of living organisms, key characteristics of anything like that. Those are things that we do all the time. And so they're skills that we really love in that game. We find key features, we analyze characteristics, and we develop questions that have purpose. And so that's what this last activity that we're going to do is. Uh, we're going to do it very basic. We're going to play around with kittens, but you're going to see how you could apply this. And you can put any picture or graph into your actual um, pick, like system, and we will get this going. So here's what we need to do. Go to, and I'm going to have you guys auto fill in the link this time. You can go to bit.ly slash polygraph. That's the name of the activity. 722, which is the date. So bit.ly slash polygraph 722. And this is just showing you the other way to possibly get into this activity, which would be a direct link instead of typing in the code. So if you guys want to go there now, we're going to do this activity. It should take five to 10 minutes. And you're going to be interacting with someone else who's actually in our group right now. So I see a couple of you guys are in. I'm going to anonymize you. When you get in, it'll ask you to play a practice round and then it will get you going. So I'll put that link back up. And again, continue to send questions through the chat. We'll be here, but give you guys a chance to play around with polygraph, which is the last big feature we're gonna look at today.
So once you complete the practice round, it's going to say that you're waiting for a partner. You might even be asked a couple questions and then you'll get matched with another partner who's somebody who's actually in our session right now. And you guys can play your own game of guess who. Hey guys, uh, I was wondering if uh, before, at the beginning of the address, you gotta put www or not? You should not need to, you can just do bit.ly. That's what I thought. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, my, my school has blog. Okay, so here's the other way we can do it. Um, can you still see our screen? Yes. So I'm going to just pull this up and this you'll do the same way as you did before. So okay. go to student.desmos and then type in that code. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for asking.
All right. Uh, okay. So I'm going to actually start by letting you guys see what pause is like. So I'm going to pause the game. So you should have seen that it came up with a pause on your screen. And um, if everybody could come back to the Zoom, we'll show you what the teacher side of this looks like. And then we'll wrap up with our session for today. So uh, this right here is the teacher's perspective. Um, and we can see who got paired up with who. You can see the questions people are asking. And this can even open the door to, I don't know if you're maybe teaching younger level children, how to ask a proper yes or no question and go over like why it was difficult for some people to guess or answer your question because it might have been a little too vague. So for example, uh, does your cat have a mustache? That might be hard to answer because especially if you're thinking of students or even younger students, how can we determine the, the cat is full of hair. So how can we determine <laughs> if the cat has a mustache or not? It might get a little subjective and then it gets a little bit harder. The other thing I love about this is you can start in your class with an activity like this where it's cats or something they're familiar with and then build it to different things. So when I do this, I do it with trigonometry graphs and we make a list of sort of taboo words. So we're not going to say is it squiggly or does it go up and down? But we're going to use that content rich vocabulary and say, is it a sine curve? Does it have a maximum of four? Does it have a period of two pi? But you can do this with anything. Um, in the in my classroom in chemistry, my students at all levels, regions through AP, struggle with particle diagrams and <laughs> particle view representations of elements, compounds, mixtures and molecules. And you can do a, a activity like this to help them really start to determine what makes a substance a liquid versus a gas, what makes a substance go through a physical versus a chemical change and stuff like that. And then the last thing that I love is that we could see over here if you were with a partner or if you were waiting for a partner, which is okay. You can do this with an odd number because if you're waiting for a partner, it's going to ask you these two questions at the top to get you thinking. So for instance, it will say, ask a question to help you figure out the difference between these two cards and we can see the different questions people asked so it gets students used to that critical analysis you think you're just answering a question i know that i'm keeping you busy because you don't have a partner which from a management perspective is a really good thing <laughs> um but yeah so you guys saw what pause was like there and again this is a great way to track okay the green check got it the red didn't so if we were looking at this in a classroom perspective, these are some different activities that are already made. They're pre-made, um, I just found them by Googling. But we have the periodic table where you could have students say, is it a gas, yes or no? Is it a noble gas, yes or no? Is it a metal or non-metal? Right, well, that's not yes or no. <laughs> oh, right. yeah. um, phases yeah. and mixtures, so different particle diagrams. This is speed and acceleration graphs. So you could have students say, is it displacement versus time versus is it velocity versus time? And even, you know, in a history class, you could do this. Like, did the person participate in the Revolutionary War or different questions like that? So you can really apply this to um, any content area. You could, you could even do it with literary, you know, terms in English. So we just wanted to wrap up with a couple tips for getting started. So number one, if you're looking for pre-made activities, I actually think for all of Desmos's strengths, <laughs> it uh, has a pretty weak search feature. And so I actually just use Google. I'll type in teacher and then Desmos so that I'm sure I'm getting an activity and then whatever I'm teaching. So for me, sometimes it's teacher Desmos differential equations. For Mark, it's teacher Desmos periodic table. But that's how I found a lot of the material that you guys have seen today. Yeah, trust me, when uh, Caitlin first introduced me to Desmos, I was like, I cannot find a darn thing. And it's just their search engine is just not good. Right. So just <laughs> I would say start with Google. Um, Teacher.desmos.com is the teacher side of things. So where everything we were showing you was, where you'd create your account, where you'd start an activity. And then the other place I'd send you to if you've never used Desmos is learn.desmos.com. It is an exceptional professional development website. It is full of everything you could ever want to know. And as you can imagine, some of those activity we did were very easy to set up. Some of them were a lot of programming to set up and it will help you through the easy to the hard. But I will say most of what we showed you today was very easy to set up and did not take us very long to put together. 
Um, let's see, we've got a couple chats. The cost, I love that question. It's free. Um, Desmos is totally free and they're very focused on staying free. And it also links with your Google Classroom automatically. So it's, totally yeah, free. It's completely and utterly free. It's, every kid in your district and every teacher in your district can just go straight to it and no issues. Yeah. Um, and then the last resource we'll share with you, and this was on our main main screen, so I'll go back to our first slide. But if you go to this link, bit.ly slash STEM Desmos, it will bring up today's presentation and it will also bring up a, a spreadsheet that I'll share with you in one second because I just want you guys to be able to get that link. And the spreadsheet I went through and found some stuff for every different content area, at least the basics. And so it might be a good place to start. To start, feel feel free to share it with other subject areas. Um, also, so let me bring that up. So it looked like this, but I have it sorted by course. So chemistry, English, history, physics, general science, world language, and Spanish. And some of these you'll even notice kind of just look like basic presentation with some questions embedded within. Yeah, so like some of these biology ones are just self-paced lessons and you'll see yeah. it's just what's an enzyme, give an answer. What is this? Define them. It's very basic. And so you can go from very basic and just use it as a remote learning tool to very sophisticated as you've seen with some of the stuff we did today. Someone had a question about Ed2D compliance. Um, let's Right up top, see. yeah. Yeah, so Ed2D law compliance, as far as I know, because it's linked with the Google accounts, as long as you're a Google school, it should seamlessly integrate with that because you're not providing any other information. Um, we're not a Google school, so I don't know that. But we, uh, you also can just have students put in numbers instead of their names if you're worried about identifying information. But I would say always check with your district about Ed2D compliance before yeah. implementing anything. Yeah, even at the beginning of the year, you can assign a kid a, a certain code. I know I assign kids certain codes for where I put the materials I'm returning back. Their class what number. Laptop something. they're picking up and stuff like that. And you can just carry that through. All right, well, we're here for five more minutes of questions. Feel free to un unmute yourself. We're gonna stop sharing our screen. Nope, go back to the Nope, first we're not. Slide. We're gonna go back to the first slide with the address. <laughs> so it's right up here, that bit.ly in the top corner. Yeah, and it's just a place to get started. It's by no means all of the resources on right. Desmos, but it's a place to just explore how other people have created things in different ways. Right. Thanks for coming, guys. Yeah, Hope everybody stays well. Thank you all for attending Community Conversations this week. And we want to thank Caitlin and Mark Geronda for sharing their experience uh, with using Desmos. I have found it to be an incredible uh, ed educational tool. I was unfamiliar with it um, up until today. Um, and uh, it'll be certainly something that I use in the future with, when working with in-service and pre-service teachers. So thank you. I also want to remind everyone that we'll be continuing this conversation via Twitter. I placed that information in the, um, the uh, chat. And so if you have questions, um, feel free to um, join us um, via Twitter. And I will be sending that information as well um, to you via email. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day. Again, Caitlin and Mark, many thanks.